The capacity for thought is the foundation upon which the greatness of man is built. Blaise Pascal, 1623-62 Men dread thinking more than they fear anything else on earth, even more than bankruptcy or death. Thought is cruelly destructive and dreadful. It is ruthless toward privilege, established institutions, and cozy habits. Thought is subversive and revolutionary. Thought stares unflinchingly into the abyss of darkness without fear. The greatest, most fleeting, and most unfettered aspect of man is his capacity for thought, which is also the source of all illumination in the cosmos. Bertrand Russell, a mathematician and philosopher who was awarded the Nobel Prize, everything that has been mentioned up to this point is absolutely accurate. It just takes one thought to completely transform one's life as happened to me when I had an epiphany. It just takes one thought to send someone to prison for the rest of their life, or it may be the impetus for a life filled with prosperity and luxury for that person. It is completely up to the person doing the thinking to decide whether their ideas are dreadful or nice and enjoyable for themselves and others around them. The concepts that individuals come up with are by far the most valuable assets in our world. The United States of America existed solely as an idea prior to the time when it was finally put into practice. Before anything existed in the real world, it simply existed as an idea in the brains of individuals. Your ideas dictate the path that your life will take, and right now, both you and I represent the sum total of the thoughts that each of us has had up to this point in our lives. That's the most we can expect from ourselves at this point. Our whole lives have been spent acting on either our own ideas or the ideas of other people depending on the situation. To think is to have ideas, and to think is to have everything. To have ideas is to think. The way in which you typically think is the most important aspect of you. It is the factor that decides everything else in your life, including the amount of money you make, the location in which you live, the things you wear, the level of education you have, the way in which you communicate, the person you marry, and the number of children you have with the exception of the things that occur to you as a direct consequence of the thoughts that others have had. It is probable that a man's decision to serve in the military for a period of time as part of being drafted into the service was the farthest thing from his mind when he made his decision. However, the fact that he is being drafted is the result of a notion that was arrived at by the people who are in charge of making judgments. This is the case because he is being drafted. It just takes one brilliant thought to set you on the course that leads to material abundance. When you sit and think about anything on a Sunday morning or afternoon, do you think your mind may wander in as many different directions as there are possible? The law of averages will begin to favor you as soon as you begin to generate fresh ideas. All it takes is for you to get the ball rolling. Let's say you decide to devote one hour of your time each day for the next half a year to producing ideas that tend to explore both your own personal potential and the aims and needs of the people you would be serving. Let's also say that you commit to doing this so that you may serve the people you will be serving. Could you come up with five fresh suggestions each and every day for the next six months? Working together, my business partner Lloyd Conan and I were able to create a product that has resulted in sales that have exceeded 25 million. This was accomplished through our collaboration. We were successful in putting everything together in a little over a month's time. What ultimately becomes a product is a notion. There are people in Japan who have a success rate of 99% when it comes to determining the gender of newborn chickens by looking at their genitalia. In spite of the fact that it seems hard to tell male young chicks from female young chicks at first appearance, they are nonetheless able to achieve this feat. However, there is no method that has been sanctioned by scientific research even comes close to having such astonishing accuracy. It is something that people do without even thinking about it. They don't need any objective evidence because they just have a gut feeling about which chicks will mature into males and which will mature into females. They just have an intuitive grasp of it. The only way for those who are interested in becoming chicken sexers to learn the job is by looking over the shoulders of experienced employees who are unable to communicate the technique that they use to sex hens. Those who are interested in becoming chicken sexers must learn the profession by looking over the shoulders of experienced workers. 
The very fact that I am able to articulate this demonstrates the phenomenal power of intuition. It's conceivable that the most effective method to generate really wonderful ideas is to allow our intuition and intellect to collaborate as guides in the process. This is an intriguing possibility. You should make it a habit to have a folded piece of paper and a writing instrument with you at all times over the course of the day. This should be something that you do automatically. People have a propensity for having ideas. Strike them at the most inconvenient times, such as while they are walking, driving, taking a shower, eating. Keep an eye out for them, particularly during breakfast and lunch, or eating a meal. When the mind is in this state, which I refer to as neutral, it affords the opportunity for ideas to come to the surface and make known. There is no guarantee that we will have our most creative moments during the think time that has been set aside for us. However, if we bury the problem that we're attempting to solve deep into our thoughts, it seems that a large section of our subconscious continues to work on the notion even when we're concentrating on something else. This is true even if we're trying to tackle a different problem. When it believes that it has discovered a solution, it waits for a period of quiet before bringing it to the surface so that it may be reviewed. This allows the solution to be properly assessed. These ideas need to be written down as soon as possible so that we can give them the consideration they deserve. To investigate what Teilhard de Chardin refers to as the Noosphere, which is an invisible layer of human intelligence that forms a mantle enveloping the Earth, I believe that our intuition has a method of doing so. This is something that we may be able to do by delving into our more distant recollections. It is a puzzle as to how it operates, but we have all seen personally at some point in our lives that it does in fact function. Planting a problem or question deep in the unconscious by first turning it every which way during an intense conscious effort to solve it frequently leads to a solution ultimately emerging in our consciousness completely unbidden. This is because turning the issue or question in every which way during the conscious effort to solve it causes it to be turned in every which direction. During the process of rigorous conscious effort, this may be performed by spinning the issue or topic in every direction possible. Of course, is a popular answer. Why in the world didn't I see that? When we turned it over in our brains, Utilizing the rotisserie of our awareness, however, it did not instantly become evident what was going on. Others who rely on it happening, anticipate it happening, and wait for it to happen as a ship's lookout waits for a light in the darkness, seem to encounter it more often than others who do not depend on it happening. If you have never given this idea a try before, you are passing up an opportunity for an experience that is not only fascinating on an unlimited level, but also very satisfying. In many instances, we are able to discern whether something is right or wrong, much in the same way that those Japanese chicken sexers are able to detect which chicks are male and which are female. Because women generally appear to be more in touch with their instincts than men are, they are often better it than men. It's likely that throughout history they've been obliged to do so, owing to a lack of physical strength that hindered females from competing with males on a more basic level. This might account for why they've been forced to do so. As a result of recent occurrences, I was kind enough to buy lunch for my grandson, who is now 11 years old. As we were making our way back to the van after the event, we came across a group of young men who seemed to be in the process of destroying a petrol station with picks and shovels. As we continued on our way, we were able to observe this activity. They were only wearing shorts up to their waists, and they worked in the middle of dense clouds of dust while shoveling broken concrete, using heavy picks and jackhammers and using heavy shovels. I came to a complete stop and turned to Danny, pointing to the younger employees as I did so, and asked him whether or not this was the kind of job that he envisioned himself doing when he was older. After watching them for a little while, he exhibited an expression of distaste by shaking his head. While Danny and I were traveling, I made the comment to him that people who have occupations that are mostly physical are not realizing their full potential because they are not challenging themselves mentally. This is the case for males as well as females. Thinking men and women do, we are able to think more clearly and effectively as well as assist a greater number of people via our ideas than we ever could by doing manual tasks alone. Not only that, 
but it's also better for our health, which is an added bonus. Then there is the pleasure of making use of our physical bodies for activities that are more delightful, such as playing tennis, golf, sailing, fishing, swimming, camping, hiking, mountain climbing, running, and exercising. These are all examples of activities that we find more enjoyable when we make use of our bodies. Danny has communicated his aspiration to one day pursue a career in either the area of astronomy or archaeology. Danny is taking the idea of going to college as if it were a given, regardless of whether or not he would end up choosing one of those professions. He is treating it as if it were a given. When we have greater knowledge, we are able to think critically about many aspects of life. College attendance is not always necessary, but it can be extremely rewarding for those who put in the necessary work to prepare for it. Former Yale University President William Lyon Phelps is credited with the following quote, The individuals who have the most intriguing images in their brains are the most interesting people. The images that we see in our minds are the beliefs that we hold dear and that help to chart the course that our lives follow. One might also refer to this as our art gallery. And interestingly enough, after we reach the age of 40 or beyond, our features often become a reflection of that art gallery. We are instructed that beyond the age of 40, the appearance of our facial characteristics is fully up to us to decide. It seems reasonable that the information that is included in our books should also be included in theirs. Because of this, a lot of people who are middle-aged or older are lovely and appealing, but a lot of them aren't, and unfortunately, we see a lot of people that fit into the latter group. The second option is that over their whole lives, they have not been able to assemble a collection of ideas that reflect pleasure, satisfaction, and a positive perspective on the future. This is the case if they have not been able to construct a collection of happy thoughts. Once again, a very small percentage of the population is comprised of those who appreciate the value that great ideas bring to our day-to-day -day lives. The plain and basic reality is that ideas are the most important thing there is. It's conceivable for a person to have appealing physical qualities, but if they don't have any outstanding ideas, the emptiness that this causes is pretty clear to everyone around them. After going to bed, I had a dream that my waking life was filled with unending joy. As soon as I opened my eyes, I was aware that living was a responsibility. I did what needed to be done, and surprise. My obligation became a source of pleasure. My commitment to a certain set of principles has helped me achieve a great degree of serenity and a sense of accomplishment on the inward journey. When the Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore of Calcutta drew out the poem, he was surely bringing to light an idea that meant a great deal to him. One of the most gratifying experiences that life has to offer is the completion of our obligations to the people or community to whom we have dedicated ourselves. Because we live in a democratic society, every one of us has the freedom to choose how we make our livelihood. As soon as we are able to support ourselves as adults, we are released from the obligation to continue doing it. It ought to be enjoyable for us to carry out our responsibilities to the very best of our abilities. In the event that it does not, there must be a mistake somewhere else in the system. It's conceivable that we have been given the wrong responsibilities to perform. Or it's also feasible that we haven't provided our work with the adequate thought it requires up to this point. Are we as prepared as we need to be given the circumstances we find ourselves in? If the work that we perform does not seem to provide any opportunity to advance our careers, the issue may lie in the way we see things. Because we do not look in enough detail or be creative enough, we are unable to notice all of the potential for expression that is there in the work that we are now doing. This prevents us from making the most of the opportunities that are available to us. Do we include the vast majority of those who seem to take it for granted that they already have enough information? Or that we will be educated while we are asleep? Or that the information that we now possess will be sufficient to get us through the remainder of our lives? Is it reasonable for us to anticipate receiving the best possible quality of service while having the least amount of inventory at our disposal? Receiving a diploma from high school or a degree from college is comparable, in the eyes of many individuals, to being immunized against a disease. In fact, this viewpoint on education is known as the vaccination hypothesis. 
and it asserts that completion of formal education takes place with the acquisition of a certificate or degree. One college president has a tale of how, on the day of the graduation ceremony, as he was making his way toward the platform, he overheard a senior saying to another senior, thank God it's done. The president was going toward the platform at the time. I have made up my mind that I am never going to pick up another book for as long as I live. He said that he had never heard anything more devastating than the comments that were being made. That young man, for some inexplicable reason, had not been sold on the idea of having an education. And interestingly enough, he did not know what the phrase commencement meant either. Education is a process that continues throughout life and should cease only when we do. Nonetheless, commencement implies the beginning of anything and not the completion of something in particular. It is the beginning of our independence to be true, but also the beginning of an enlightened education that will assist us in developing the mental pictures that will determine who we are as people. Ideas, especially great ideas that push us to be greater and larger than we are today, are the deeply entrenched anchors that will hold us in place steadfastly even when the turbulent winds and seas of life crash about us. Ideas are the anchors that motivate us to be better and bigger than we are today. They act as the moorings that prevent us from being scared or derailed off our path by expediency, fad, or demagogy. They also function as the anchors that protect us from drifting aimlessly. Great ideas provide us with a set of sensors that can pick up on dishonesty and phoniness exposing what is cheap and poor, as well as what is frequently referred to as the easy buck. In other words, great ideas teach us how to spot dishonesty and phoniness. It is possible for us to keep our sense of humor while reaping the benefits of the lifelong security system that is provided for us by brilliant ideas. In fact, the introduction of such ideas provides a huge boost to our sense of humor and as a result, smiling and laughing become vital components of our days. Expanding our horizons and delving into the unknown always leads to making mistakes. And although we are not immune to doing so, we are conscious that this is a natural and unavoidable part of the process. If we want to be successful in reaching our goals, the ideas that we subscribe to should be compatible with those goals. What precisely does the term concept mean? People will shout, I have an idea, from time to time. Just what is it, exactly? It is fairly likely that there is more to it than just a neurochemical and electrical response, despite the fact that it is both of those things. When previously obtained pieces of knowledge are integrated in such a manner as to yield an unanticipated outcome, this is the process that gives rise to an idea. You enthusiastically ask everyone else, shall we go to the beach? Before choosing the known beach, we don't even give it a second of consideration before making our decision. We take one component, combine it with pre-existing transportation facilities, proper dress, and maybe even a picnic lunch, and then present the combined whole as the concept to the people who we are now with at this very time. It all happens in the blink of an eye despite the fact that our brains are simultaneously engaged in the process of creating a wide variety of connections. The more fundamental information we have, the more potential combinations we'll be able to conceive of, and the farther we'll be able to take what Dr. Robert Schuller calls possibility thinking. Because of this, young people need to give the school courses that they state they'll never utilize as adults a second consideration before complaining about them. When it comes to the process of forming notions, we might potentially gain something from any and all information of a constructive kind. When we set a meaningful goal for ourselves, we provide our brains with a problem that needs to be addressed and a challenge that has to be fulfilled in a manner that is both rewarding and beneficial. Instantaneously, the mind begins to work deep inside the labyrinthine interstices of its infinite potential in order to seek the information we need in order to turn that concept into a reality. This process may take a very long time. This extraordinary talent is often put to use in order to attain straightforward objectives. For example, the idea of owning a certain automobile swiftly materializes into an actual car that we may drive and clean on lazy Sunday afternoons when the weather is pleasant. 
It's likely that our trip from the time we receive the idea to the moment we get in the vehicle, turn the key, and drive away is quite convoluted or even circular, bringing us first, here and then there. This is something we should keep in mind as we go forward. We might have saved ourselves a lot of trouble and made the process a lot less difficult if we had just paid attention to the guidance that keeps popping into our brains. On the other hand, the majority of the time we create obstacles for ourselves by disregarding the guidance that is provided to us, only to discover at a later time that it would have been an excellent strategy to reduce the amount of work that was required of us. However, in the end, the notion, which was previously ethereal, materializes as sheet steel and glass in addition to upholstery and rubber, and it also sometimes causes soreness in the neck. Although it will take us three years to pay for it, we will finally be able to make the notion a part of our everyday lives. This strategy for reaching our objectives is the wellspring of everything great that enters our lives during its course. It is the driving force behind our success. Quite frequently it entails nothing more complex than a trip to the grocery store, a phone conversation, or an instruction issued to a teenager. The actualization phase occurs after the idea phase. It is still the same process that will end in satisfaction, even if our ideas increase in degree, cost, and complexity. Alternatively, they will be frightened off by shyness, reasoning, or on occasion just plain good common sense. It is still the same process that will end in fulfillment. Sometimes when we are toying with or fiddling with a beautiful idea, our mental process is overrun by other ideas, meaning that the particular tasty idea in question will have to be postponed for a year or two, maybe five years, or even longer than that. This means that the idea will have to be shelved for a longer period of time. Our style of thinking informs us. Yes, it tells us that we have made the sort of quantum leap that is out of place if we are going to stick to our present objectives and ideals. If we are going to adhere to our current goals and ideas, this is problematic. If this is the case, then this is something that can be deduced from the way that we think about things. The ability to put off satisfaction for a longer period of time is generally seen as a sign of maturity. As a result of this, it is strongly suggested that the list be compiled on paper. However, this does not exclude the possibility that any of the things on the list might be subject to improvisation. It is not at all unusual for us, as we discover how fast such a system affords us fulfillment of our goals, to update our list to include levels that we may not have originally imagined were within the realm of possibility for us. This happens because we are learning how quickly such a system provides us with fulfillment of our objectives. In fact, it is not at all uncommon for us to realize how easily such a method enables us to achieve the objectives we have set for ourselves. This strategy is used on a daily basis by millions of people who do not give it a second thought and who have no knowledge whatsoever of the procedure at all. Once a system has been well understood and verified, it may be used for any and every goal-related information that is given serious attention. This opens up a lot of possibilities. All that is asked of us is to provide it to the system and let it handle it from there. In order for us to make use of the system, having an in-depth understanding of everything that goes into it is not required. When we make an attempt to examine and grasp each and every phase of the working process, we have a propensity to get in our own way, which in turn limits the potential accomplishments we are capable of achieving. It serves its purpose well. Just let things alone for the time being. Even though the process of thinking itself is within our control, the content of our thoughts determines who we are. It is hard to put a number on the degree to which people consistently underestimate their own talents as well as their potential for accomplishment. We don't give a second thought to the accomplishments of other people, which is another way of saying that we don't normally place a lot of weight on what other people are able to do. When it comes to setting goals for ourselves, though, we have a propensity to be extremely careful, and as a consequence, we prefer to stay within parameters that are excruciatingly constricted. This is especially true if there is some type of maintenance program that is presently being carried out since this makes the situation much more relevant. That is to say, if we have a job, even if it is a job with very few needs put upon us, 
we will typically cease making any further efforts to prepare ourselves for the future. This is true even if the job has very few duties placed upon us. 1. Work of far better quality and a much more interesting variety. 2. Any sudden and unanticipated emergency that could occur. I remember very well seeing a television news program in which former workers at a navy yard that had been deactivated were being questioned. The announcer addressed the crowd with the following question. Now that the navy yard has been decommissioned, what are you guys going to do with yourselves? The person who was standing closest to him was the one who spoke first. They responded, Well, I suppose we'll just have to wait for it to open back up again. Another individual stood up and said, I've been working in this navy yard for the past quarter of a century. I am completely ignorant about everything. If we are to believe these individuals, then these humans were nothing more than human cattle that were kept in a single pasture and were only allowed to graze there. They would do nothing except sit there and watch their lives pass them by since the pasture was no longer in its previous location. Over the course of 25 years, a person may, in their spare time, acquire the knowledge necessary to do heart transplants. What did all of these people do with the 16 hours that they had each day in which they were not required to work? What about the weekends and the times when there are no classes? Take out a calculator, some paper, and some writing implements, and calculate the number of hours that the average working person is actually present at their job each year. This will take some time. After that, subtract that amount of time from the total amount of time that person spent awake. If one spent one hour each day learning something new or participating in activities of a constructive nature, then the loss of a job would be a minor annoyance at worst, and it may even be seen as a good turn of events. And how about setting aside some time to just think? Any person who is accountable for the care of a family should, at the very least, have Plan A in place to cope with unforeseen circumstances, and ideally they should have Plans A, B, and C. When engaged in combat, a platoon leader is required to question himself on a consistent basis. What if the enemy attacks at night? Are you approaching from the rear? During the weekend, as you are getting ready for the day? Whoever brings in the most money for the family should be the one to pose the question, what do we do if the company I work for goes out of business, or lets me go for whatever reason? Then make a rough draft of the solution on that legal pad. This is the kind of thinking that a husband and wife may undertake together as well as separately, and as a result they'll come up with a variety of various choices for how to go forward in the situation as a result of their efforts. And while we're at it, what are your thoughts on the possibility of enrolling in that educational program that is centered on your core area of interest? You should do all in your power to guarantee that the person you are today will not be the same person you are in five years. On the other hand, the personnel of the Navy Yard who were quizzed for that particular episode of television showed the same level of ignorance that they had shown 20 years before. When I was a young kid of 12 years old, I questioned grown-ups and discovered that the adults were not one iota smarter than they had been when they were 15 years old. This was something that I discovered through my questioning of the adults. They have completely disabled their ability to think and acquire new information. They were living entities that responded in some way to stimuli of the simplest kind, but that was the end of their capacities. When they noticed that they were beginning to feel hungry, they set out on an adventure across the area in quest of something to eat. In that order, sleep, eating, and having sexual relations. The remainder of the time was taken up by whatever components of their reality happened to present themselves to them at that particular instant. They laughed throughout each episode of Jack Benny, Fibber McGee, and Molly, which they listened to on the radio and liked listening to. They giggled, slapped their legs, and shook their heads before returning to the regular state of semi-consciousness that they experienced when awake. During the economic turmoil that began in the 1980s, a familiar theme that we heard was, I worked for that firm for 30 years, and now I'm out of a job, just like that. In other words, many lost their job suddenly, after having worked for the same company for a long period of time. If you listen to them talk, you may get the sense that they had sacrificed some facets of their personal lives, 
in order to secure the success of the company for which they worked. This is because you might get the impression that they compromised certain parts of their personal lives. They make no mention of the fact that the company reimbursed them for the time that they spent on the task and supplied them with the resources required to become anything they may have dreamed of being in the future. Both of these benefits were provided by the company. They were neither detained against their will nor coerced into doing the duty. Hence, the arrangement was reasonable and equitable. They applied for the job, which resulted in their acceptance, and they were paid an acceptable amount for the amount of work that they completed. There was no agreement in place to provide them with employment until they reached an age or had a physical condition that prevented them from continuing to work. Why didn't they take into consideration the possibility of getting fired and make preparations to cope with an issue that was completely out of the blue? My pals John and Elsie did. After John was fired from his job, he and Elsie made the decision to sell their house in Ohio and go to Florida, where they could spend their golden years in the pleasant climate and take advantage of their retirement. If he had been laid off a number of years earlier, they may have been able to turn their part-time real estate business into their full-time career. They bought, renovated, and sold real estate as part of their business. They would be fabulously rich right now if they had done what they could have done. The trouble for John and Elsie was that, like so many of us, they made the typical error of underestimating what they could achieve working for themselves, given the amount of time that John was devoting to his job at the steel mill. The problem was that John and Elsie underestimated what they could accomplish working for themselves, given the amount of time that John was devoting to his job at the steel mill. They did not quit the job voluntarily very often due to the fact that it offered a consistent weekly income, which is something that the vast majority of people do not have. The vast majority of individuals, on the other hand, come to see their places of employment and the labor unions they belong to as parental figures growing to depend on them for their safety and their ability to continue living. Because the company is so big, with such large smokestacks, and because it employs so many people, and because it produces so much steel or anything else, it appears as though it will be there forever, and all they need to do to keep their job is show up to work, do whatever is required to keep it, and then go home. They don't have to stress about how they're going to fill the rest of their lives with all those uncountable hours, year after year, decade after decade. They can just let it pass with as little routine as possible. Why does no one care to engage these folks in a conversation on the subject of change? How is it that some people are able to isolate themselves from the knowledge that is pertinent to their situation? It would seem that they have totally wrapped themselves in ignorance which is then wrapped in shibboleths and myths. I know. I was a part of their community at the time. My eyes would be irreparably damaged if I continued to read that way, as my father often cautioned me to refrain from doing so. Reading doesn't hurt. It will be beneficial to the eyes in general, but the gray matter that is placed just behind them will benefit from it much more. But all of this is changing in a manner that is gradual but consistent. As time goes on, more and more people are joining the group that thinks, and this trend is expected to continue. In this world, thoughts and concepts are more important than anything else. And each one of us has a very unique ability for the processing of thoughts. The enormous brain that is characteristic of Homo sapiens, the only member of the genus Homo to have survived to the present day, is something that is present from birth and is considered to be standard equipment. As soon as a baby is born, we find ourselves in possession of a gorgeous living creature whose destiny is shrouded in a great deal of mystery for us. What mind-blowing ideas are going to spring out of that creature's head? And with such tools, what kind of life might this young person fashion for themselves? According to Peter Drucker, public education is an institution that was built for the maintenance of adolescence. It was immediately obvious to me that Drucker was educated in the subject area that he was addressing as I was having a conversation with three high school kids one morning while we were eating breakfast. Obviously, having a conversation with three 17-year-old girls for a quarter of an hour does not qualify as an in-depth study. On the other hand, the people with whom I interact on a daily basis in my capacity as a sales clerk in shops and as a customer service representative on the telephone 
appear to provide very little in the way of encouragement. It is said that just 10% of all fishermen catch 80% of all the fish captured. Yet the average person who likes fishing is not an exceptionally skilled fisherman. The typical guy who goes fishing just because he loves it is not a very skilled angler. The average bowler is not very skilled at bowling. Just as the average golfer is not particularly skilled at golf and so on and so forth. Someone once remarked that the majority of us only do as much as we need to in order to get by without receiving an excessive amount of responsibility for our actions. This is a statement that has been made in the past. The expression, that's good enough, is one that is used rather often. Yet the normal understanding of this phrase is, it's actually not very good at all. It is possible that this is the narrative of the lives of a great number of people in the world's wealthiest nation, which also provides its residents with the greatest number of choices possible. It is sad that thinking was never required coursework at any of the public schools that I have been a part of throughout my education. Not remembering, which is what the vast bulk of the work that kids do in school is about, but rather thinking one, thinking a two, thinking a three, thinking I-4, and so on, all the way up into the more advanced levels of university study and beyond. Unfortunately, it is not something that is taught in our school system, even though it is the highest conceivable function that a human being is capable of fulfilling. The act of considering is one that is performed without much thought. Every working person should be given a tape cassette program and printed material entitled Your Life and Your Work after successfully completing a training program offered by their firm. The program should be on a cassette and the content should be printed. The bulk of the material that we are going over here would be included in it as well as other subjects such as basic aptitude tests, recommended savings plans, and emergency planning that are intended to aid the person in discovering the main area in which they have natural ability. This would be the case since it would be included in it. It is expected that the person will find all of this interesting. It provides us with choices, options, and even more possibilities, which is precisely what we need in order to construct the sorts of plans that would maximize, at least to some degree, who we are and what we are capable of achieving. It opens all kinds of wonderful windows of opportunity for us, providing us with choices, options, and even more options. Options, alternatives, and a greater number of possibilities. The phrase, you have lost your job, would be shown on the screen to introduce a part of the program with the same name. This section will answer the issue, what can you do that the community wants or needs, with the understanding that the community refers to the whole of the United States of America and the free world. My great friend Derm Barrett, who is a business consultant in Ontario, Canada, spent a total of 800 hours learning Spanish in such detail that he is now able to offer business seminars in a number of Latin American countries. Because of his extensive knowledge of the language, he is able to do this. It opened up a whole new world of options and things that attracted him that he might explore as a result of having access to this information. The entire amount of time invested was 800 hours. That is almost similar to the amount of time that the majority of people who are employed devote to their jobs in only 20 weeks. Learning Spanish will familiarize you with a culture that is both quite varied and highly intriguing, and it will do so in a way that is either all-encompassing or introductory, depending on your preference. And if there is any part of the globe that is in need of modern business knowledge, it would have to be Latin America. Over the phone, I could sense Derm Barrett's excitement and enthusiasm as he recounted how he had accepted the challenge of learning Spanish, using his own ideas of time management and goal planning, and how amazing the experiences that ensued were and are. He described how he had taken on the task of learning Spanish, using his own ideas of time management and goal planning. He described how he had used his own ideas about how to schedule his time and achieve his objectives in order to meet the challenge of learning Spanish. His options had greatly broadened since then, and how much the natives admire us whenever we attempt to converse with them in their native tongue, which is not one of ours. It's possible that being fired from our jobs will turn out to be the best thing that ever happens to us. It forces us to do something that we were not able to muster the strength, creativity, 
or drive to accomplish when we had secure work, and that is to go farther afield for opportunities that are greater and more attractive. This is a result of the fact that the job market has become more competitive. After the initial disbelief and a period of mourning, we often discover that we are now in a position of work that is far more to our liking, with many more opportunities for advancement than we were ever given by our old company. After we have recovered from the first shock and despair, we often discover that our new line of employment is much more to our liking. Surveys of men and women who have attained remarkable success have shown that the job they left behind was strongly associated with their later accomplishments. This was the case both before and after they achieved success. It made no difference whether they had voluntarily quit the job or been fired from it. Either way, they were no longer employed there. Before joining our firm, every member of our management team cut their teeth in a variety of other fields, first in their own professions. That joy suffuses their hearts completely. The fact that they are now working and earning a higher income provides evidence in support of my theory. They are now enjoying work that is far more stimulating for them, and as a direct consequence, they are making more money than they ever had before in their lives. In the realm of business, the concept that we should focus our mental energy, not only on things that are functioning poorly or might require some kind of adjustment, but also on things that are operating at their optimal level, and generating the greatest amount of money is a good one, and it is supported by an enticing line of thought. This is because the idea that we should focus our mental energy on things that are operating at their optimal level and generating the greatest amount of money generates the greatest amount of money. If we apply what we know about business to our thinking, there is the greatest potential for profit. To put it another way, you should not wait until the very last second to think about something that is significant. Instead, while it is still operating at its optimal level, you should seek ways to improve and modernize it while it is still in operation. And this method of thinking is the one that is most beneficial to us in the long run. After you have already been let go from your present job, it is too soon to start thinking about potential new employment opportunities. Think about them when life is going well for you, when you are not experiencing any type of stress, and when you are not going through a period in which you are experiencing a decline in your sense of self-worth. Now, pull out your reliable yellow legal pad, and at the top of one of the pages write, I need better, more interesting, and more gratifying employment. When put in such a position, the first question that comes to mind is probably, can I find it at the company where I am currently employed? What can I do for the company that I work for now that will make a contribution to the business that is more significant than the job that I am doing right now? What am I able to accomplish that will make a contribution that is more significant than the job that I am doing right now? Another question that may be posed is, given the choice between this occupation and any other occupation in the world, which one would I like to perform for a living? And at this point, we may start creating a list of probable replies, which we will later rate and order according to the relative relevance of each of the responses that we have gathered. After each proposal, we need to ask ourselves, am I now ready to undertake such work? And what actions should I take to guarantee that I am adequately prepared for such work? You may also ask yourself, what is it that I am capable of achieving? that will be of the most assistance to the people of this town, this state, this nation, or perhaps the whole world. Following this, there will be yet another list of the correct answers. The more we tinker with ideas like this, the more we'll be able to conceive of them. Each fresh concept gives birth to further ones just as a fish lays eggs, and this process continues indefinitely. In addition, each of the eggs lays the groundwork for the development of more ideas. Now we're getting somewhere. Now that we are making use of the equipment that we were supposed to utilize, we are also making use of the object that we hold in the highest regard. Remember to constantly jot everything down and never think this way without a pen and paper, preferably a yellow pad. Always jot down anything you think. If it is at all possible for you to do so, continue writing page after page for as long as the ideas continue to come to you. When one looks into how they think, some individuals may discover that their thoughts come to them very slowly and painfully. This is something that may be discovered when one explores how they think. 
However, if you keep pushing yourself and reminding yourself that thinking is a painful process, you will find that the ideas flow to you more quickly and increase in quality. This may be accomplished by continuing to push yourself and by reminding yourself that thinking is a rigorous process. Do not give up the moment you have what can be considered your first intriguing idea. Continue your quest for new and improved ideas after writing them down, underlining them, drawing a star next to them or a circle around them, and so on. You'll find that fresh ideas continue to come to you even after you've done all of these things. I find that getting up early in the morning is the ideal time for me to get things done. So I recommend that you do the same. Work on this in your spare time for many days and weeks until you have at least plan A worked out. If it doesn't work, Go on to plan B. Have a conversation about the problems at hand with either your wife or your husband in order to get their perspective on the situation. Because of the new chances that have been available to you, you will quickly realize that you are grinning widely and are as content as a young kid. If you are not accustomed to writing, which is sadly the situation for millions of other Americans, please start getting in the habit of writing as soon as possible using your legal pad. If you are not used to writing, which is unfortunately the case for lots of other Americans, you should not for one second kid yourself into believing that you will be able to recollect all of the concepts that float to the top of your head. Rather, you should scribble them down on some paper as soon as they come to you. If you want to improve your writing talents, there is a terrific way that is open to you, and it is as follows. Simply pick up any respectable book, read it, and then paraphrase what it says. While you are writing the text, be sure that you are copying all of the punctuation marks and paying attention to the beginning of each new paragraph as you go from page to page and word to word. When you read aloud while you're working on your writing, you will find that your speaking skills develop at the same time that your writing becomes easier to understand and more natural. Keep a dictionary accessible at all times and make it a practice to look up the meaning of any terms you come across that you are unfamiliar with. You may soon reach a place where writing is simple, fun, and undemanding for you if you commit 30 minutes of your time every day to working on this skill. As time goes on, you'll notice that your writing has improved and gotten easier to read. Make sure that each and every word that you write can be read without any trouble at all. The unique writing style developed by W. Somerset Maugham was greatly influenced by this approach to writing. It was during the summer vacation of a child who was 10 years old that I suggested to the mother of that kid that she supervise her son's reading and writing for one hour a day over the summer. I wanted to make sure that her son was developing his literacy skills. I made the observation that when he went back to school in the fall, he would have a substantial edge over the other pupils in his class since he had been away for the summer. She gave me a look that indicated she was wondering how she would react if I suggested that her child learn Chinese. I took this to mean that she was thinking about how she would respond. It was obvious that she would not take my recommendations into account, and it was also obvious that her son's reading and writing skills would not improve as a result of her actions. The freedom to act on our own accord is one benefit that might come from ideas. Ideas have the power to liberate us from our chains you will come to realize that there are other opportunities open to you, as well as additional places to which you may go. Good ideas consist of things that are magnificent, delectable, and entrancing in equal measure. They give an explanation for why some people are able to create considerably greater pay after retirement than they did while doing the vocations that they clung to with such tenacity while they were earning a living. In other words, they explain why some people are able to generate much higher wages after retirement, throughout the course of this time span, which ranges from 35 to 40 years, since a pension offers a saving base below which they know their income cannot fall. They realize that they now have the courage to pursue the aims and ideas that they lack the guts to pursue while they were working. This is because they know that their income cannot go below the level that the pension provides. Because of this, they are able to have the assurance that their revenue will never drop below this level. That shouldn't be an issue at all. Regarding the time limit within which we should carry out our tasks, there is nothing that can be considered fixed in stone. For me, it doesn't matter what hour it is. 
On the other hand, it is very uncommon for people in this predicament to make statements such as, I should have done this 30 years ago. My God, just try to picture the state of my life right now if I hadn't done that. And to think of all the fun moments we might have had together. The unpleasant truth is that as long as we are still alive, we will never arrive at a point where we are completely secure. It is never possible to achieve safety in the midst of one's existence. One can only do so at either the beginning or the end of their journey through this world. If we want to have a sense of safety throughout our whole lives, we are going to have to make peace with the idea of basing that safety on something that cannot be guaranteed. Instead of being the chimera, the fire-breathing, multi-legged, clawed beast that we believe insecurity to be, insecurity is just the normal situation that we are in. There is a possibility that independence is associated with uncertainty. It gives us the options we need in order to create a life that is fascinating and challenging for us. And it does this by providing us with a variety of options. Because it forces us to depend only on ourselves, fear motivates us to improve ourselves and become better versions of ourselves. Putting away the equivalent of either six months or a year's worth of pay in a savings account is not a bad idea in any way. This also gives us the ability to live our lives freely and independently. It gives us some time so that we may think about our alternative choices. If a concept results in a change for the better, then we may say that the idea was successful and the shape that a concept takes is not relevant to the quality of the idea itself. A good notion demands modification. Also, a fantastic idea for making money doesn't necessarily need to come up with anything that is highly innovative to be successful. Everything that has already been successful because of amazing ideas has the potential to attain even higher heights of achievement, yet this potential is often overlooked. It is not impossible for a local small business that is currently producing a profit for its proprietor to grow to the point where it produces an even larger profit via the use of certain expansion strategies. Under no circumstances should you ever use the phrase, I'd want to get to the point where I can start taking things easy. I'd want to reach the point where I can begin relaxing about things. You surely have the power to outsource tedious jobs to other people. Nonetheless, you should not cease thinking about the future and making plans for it. If you don't, you'll die. As soon as a person is unable to participate in any activities that they like, the beginning of their protracted and gradual decline might be said to have occurred. They begin to come apart and things in general start going in the wrong direction. After you've left this world, you'll at last be free to unwind and take it easy. People who never find themselves bored or without anything to do have a significantly increased likelihood of living a long and healthy life. They are farmers, which implies that in addition to fresh crops to plant and harvest, new cows to milk, and a hundred other things that need their attention at the same time, they also have new crops to sow. They may be teachers who begin the new school year with a whole new class, or writers who conclude a piece on one subject before moving on to another. Either way, they begin their work on a fresh topic, and they are the type of people who never find themselves at a loss for novel ideas. When they do in the end reach the conclusion of their lives, their image gradually disappears, as if it were being removed from a film that was being shown at the cinema, but suddenly ceased operating. Reading Ortega has shown us that humans are the only creatures on the whole planet that are born in a state of natural perplexity with our world. This was an interesting and eye-opening discovery for us. Reading provided us with the necessary information to acquire this knowledge. Every other recently hatched species seems to be adapting extremely well to the new habitat in which it finds itself. They never have to ask themselves, what will I do? since they are wholly controlled by their instincts and react in an instinctual fashion to whatever stimuli have an influence on them. This eliminates the need for them to ponder the question. Why were we prevented from reaching this specified level of development? We are the only known species that can create our very own universe entirely within the context of the one that already exists and of which we are a part. Having the power to do so is quite remarkable, because the ideas we have such a significant impact on our lives, it stands to reason that ideas are among the most important things in the world. 
Unhappily, for far too many of us, the lack of great ideas rather than the existence of such ideas is the primary factor that shapes our lives. A poet had penned the line, blessed is the man who has discovered his job in the past. Without a doubt, a clever suggestion, the man or woman who identifies an area of study that may be explored indefinitely, has a tremendous amount of untapped potential for their own life's trajectory. Permit me to emphasize yet another fantastic idea for you. Such work is accessible to each and every one of us. If we have not found it yet, the most effective course of action that we can take is to keep seeking it until we find it. There is nothing more that can be done on our end. Another wonderful idea is that the honors and accolades bestowed upon us throughout the course of our lives will be precisely proportionate to the amount of service we have rendered. We have come together to assist one another in whatever way we can over the rest of our lives.